would you take your Bibles and turn to Haggai? We're going to talk this morning about priorities, I guess is what you'd call them. And this morning, we're going to be in chapter number one of the book of Haggai. And I want to pull out of this chapter what I believe is the way to overhaul your priorities in about one day. Really, I, I believe that. I'm not going to give you a 12-month program. Uh, I'm going to give you a one-day program. Uh, you could straighten out all of your priorities right now in the next 24 hours if you were to take what is given in chapter number 1 and apply it to your own personal life. And in Haggai chapter 1, we have a lot of information that's given by the prophet Haggai. When we look at this, and I want to read this for you. I'm going to read the entire first chapter so that we can get a grip of what's happening. It says, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, Unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai unto the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? Saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste and ye run every man to his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands." Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltal, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. 
in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month and in the second year of Darius the king. Now all of this may seem confusing on the surface as to what they're talking about and what's going on. But whether we realize it or not, chapter number one will help us to begin to overhaul our priorities if we listen to what God is trying to say. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning before we do anything else. Father God, we come before you and we ask a blessing this morning. God, we come before you and we ask that you would speak to hearts. Lord, I pray that you would help us begin to prioritize our lives in a way that would be pleasing to you. Lord, I ask today that if there's somebody in here who has never received Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today you would help them to realize that is the number one priority in their life. That there is nothing more important than making Jesus Christ their Savior. Lord, I ask if there is somebody here today and you speak to their heart, Lord, I pray that you would give them the courage to respond and say, yes, I need Christ as my Savior. I am without Jesus Christ. I have never asked Him and called upon His name. God, I pray that you would speak to that person here today. Lord, I pray for those who know Christ as their Savior Lord, this journey we call the Christian life is long and can be wearisome. And sometimes through the process of walking this journey and traveling this road, Lord, sometimes we lose track of our priorities. God, I pray that through your word this morning, you would help us to see how we can fix that how we can overhaul the priorities that may have gotten mixed up along the way. I pray that you would help us this morning, Father God. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever we talk about priorities, I'm always reminded of a story that I heard many years ago. There was a group of hunters who went out into the woods to go deer hunting, and they split up into groups of two. And uh, as they went out and, and hunted that morning, uh, lunchtime came around and so they began to, to come back. And they were all sitting around the lunch table and there were two in their group that, that were missing. And as they peered down the trail, they could see one of their friends walking and he had a deer on his back. And so they ran out to him and they said, well, congratulations on the deer. This is great news. And he said, well, he said, yeah, it was quite an exciting event this morning. Uh, and they said, well, uh, where, where's John, uh, the other guy that was with you? And he said, well, you know, we were way back in the woods and, and he dropped of a heart attack. And uh, they kind of looked at him and said, well, uh, well, uh, we're, you know, uh, poor John. You left John laying out in the woods, and, and yet you, you, you grabbed your deer. You were, you're able to carry the deer, and, and you weren't able to carry John back here? What's going on? And he says, well, I figured no one would steal old John. So it kind of reminds us of sometimes our priorities can get mixed up. And although it's funny and it's a joke and we laugh about it and think, oh, what, what absurdity it is, it happens in each and every one of our lives. Almost to the point of being absurd. But let me assure you this morning that the results of it are not as humorous as a quick-witted story. That oftentimes the results of mixed up priorities have drastic 
consequences. Consequences that will cost us years and cost us relationships, cost us energy and time. And so we look at this as a very serious issue, the idea of priorities. Now let me give you a a little bit of background information as to what is going on. To give you the history of this story, first of all we have to understand that history tells us in 586 the Babylonian Empire marched into Jerusalem and destroyed Solomon's temple that he had built. In fact, not only did they destroy the temple, but they destroyed Jerusalem. And not only did they destroy Jerusalem, but they destroyed most of Israel as well. And what the Babylonians did was also take into captivity all the smart Jews that were in the land of Israel. And that's where the story of the book of Daniel begins with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel not eating and defiling himself with the king's meat. And then it was later on after that event that they were taken into captivity, Israel was destroyed, and the temple was destroyed, that the Medo-Persians came on the scene and ultimately conquered the Babylonian Empire. And then that was prophesied by God, of course, and when the Medo-Persians took over, and that's King Darius here in this first chapter of the book of Haggai, He was kind enough to allow the Jews to return back to their homeland. He was kind enough to allow the Jews to go back and begin to rebuild Jerusalem and even rebuild the temple. We, of course, get the book of Nehemiah from that and other books as well. And so we see that the background history information to all of this is that the Jews had returned to their homeland after centuries of being in captivity by the Babylonian Empire and then being ultimately set free to return back to their homeland by the Medo-Persians. The problem is, is that when the Jews got back to Israel, they immediately began to rebuild their own houses. They immediately began to put the pieces of their own lives back together and start building their fence around their house and start building their house proper and start to take all of the destruction out of their yards and begin to reclaim their own land. God looked down upon this and He saw that His house was in destruction that his house still laid in waste. All the while, his own children were worried about their own houses. And so God sent a message through a messenger. His name was Haggai. He was a prophet of God, and he was sent to deliver a message and say, why are you building your own houses when my house lies waste. You see, what it is is a perfect example of what is inside all of us. It's a perfect example of human nature. We often prioritize what we want. Amen? To us, that's the priority. Are you with me this morning? We learned on Wednesday night that in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, the Bible tells us to be warned and to watch out for what the Bible calls seducing spirits. Now think about that for a minute. And as we talked about on Wednesday, what does it mean to be seduced? Or what does it mean to seduce somebody? All it simply means is to get somebody to want to do something, right? The Bible describes how Eve was seduced in the Garden of Eden. Well, what happened there? The devil simply got her to want to eat the fruit that God forbid. So one of the key elements in understanding seduction is realizing that part of seduction is just simply getting us to desire something. And that when Satan tries to seduce us, 
through those seducing spirits, we can very much look at the desires and the wants of mankind. Right? Now think this through with me for just a minute. And as we talked about on Wednesday night, it's interesting to see how people make decisions. Most of us make decisions based on what? What we want. Amen? Most of us make decisions based on one thing, what we want and what we desire. And yet the Bible tells us that in the latter days, people will be seduced by spirits. It means they will get to the point where they want to do what they want to do. They will get to the point where they do what they want to do. It doesn't matter what God wants anymore. When you're seduced, you just simply are brought to the point where you desire it. And so people make decisions as to what church they go to based on what? What they want. This church has this kind of youth group. I like that. It serves me well. This church has a Starbucks in their fellowship hall. I like that, so let's go there. This church has this to offer and that to offer, so let's go there. We make decisions even about spiritual things based on what we want and desire. And that's an earmark of a generation that has been seduced. Right? Not only that, but... How do we decide when we go to church? Right? We decide when we want to go to church based off of what? When we want to. Right? We decide what kind of music we'll listen to based on what? What we want. We'll even decide what kind of Bible version we read based on what? The one we like. Do you realize that we are a generation of Christians who make even the most fundamental spiritual decisions based on one thing, our wants and desires? And the Apostle Paul said, yep, that's exactly the way it's going to be. There will come a day when Satan will seduce people. And Satan will get them to do his bidding simply by getting them to want to do it. Amen. Isn't that profound? Amen. But you know what it is, ultimately? Ultimately, it boils down to we've got messed up priorities. And we really need to take a look at what's going on in our lives. We have to examine what's happening in our lives. Examine it not against our desires and wants and wishes, but examine it against Scripture. Amen. We should make decisions based on God's Word, not what we want and desire. Amen. Truth should be the guide that brings us there. So we come to the place, the same place, that the children of Israel were in when God delivered this message to Haggai. They were doing what they were doing based off of what they wanted. I want my house. I want my house nice. I want my house rebuilt. I want my yard clean. I want my property back. And they had made themselves a priority instead of making God the priority. Do you know that Scripture tells each and every one of us in the book of Colossians, it says that he should have the preeminence in all things? Amen. What does that mean? It means that he should come first in everything. Right. Above your desires, above your wants, above your wishes, God comes first. Amen. Now, I want to give you what I see in Scripture here is the steps to overhaul your priorities. Are you with me? Let's first take a look at this one. First step is this. Recognize wrong priorities. You with me? Recognize wrong priorities. 
How can you change something if you don't realize and recognize that it exists in your life? That's the idea behind confession, that God says, confess your sins. And He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But God says the first thing you need to do is recognize it. Is to see that it exists. If we're not willing to see that we have priorities that are out of whack, well, then there's nothing we can do to fix them. I want you to look at chapter number 1, and I want you to follow along with me. And verses 1 through 5 give us this first step of recognizing wrong priorities. First of all, I want you to look at verse number 2. Look at verse 2. God sends His prophet out to deliver a message. The message is, your priorities are mixed up. And I want you to see it. I want you to recognize it. I want you to realize that you're putting things first that shouldn't be first. That you're making things important that shouldn't be important. And what does he say? Well, the prophet, through the Spirit of the Lord, speaks this in verse number 2. He says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say... The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. <laughs> Y'all awake this morning? Or does that rain have you sleeping? Do you want to know a little secret? Nobody in here says no to God. Oh, no, no, no. We don't say no to God. We've become much more, uh, what would you say? Oh, we've become much more uh, deceptive than that. Right? At least to say no is to be honest. Amen? I mean, even Jesus Christ commended the man in the New Testament who said no, then came back and said yes. And he condemned the man who said yes and didn't do it. We don't say no. Oh, we're more crafty than that. Let's give ourselves a little credit. No one in here would claim to be a Bible-believing Christian and attend Berean Bible Baptist Church and say, no, God, I'm not going to do that. You know what we do? All we simply say is, I'll do it later. Right? What does verse 2 say? Oh, they were just as crafty as Bereans are today. Verse number 2, God delivers the message, and He says, why are you building your own houses when my house is in waste? And God says, this is what the people are going to say. Well, now's not the time. We'll do it, but we'll do it later. We're not saying no to you, God. We would never say no to you. We love you. It's just not time yet. And so people say, later. Right? Right? When are you going to start to work on your marriage? You know your priorities are mixed up. Eh, later. Now's not the time. i got a lot going on right now. When are you going to start to raise your kids according to God's Word? Amen? Eh, now's not the time. I'll do it later. We would never say, no, I'll just do it later. Amen? When are you going to start to get serious about God? When are you going to start to get plugged in and find a place where you can serve God? When are you going to find a place where you can do what God has called you to do? 
When are you going to make that a priority? Because you would never say, no, God, I'm not doing that. You would just simply say, well, I, I'll do it later, right? Hey, when I retire, I'll have plenty of time, right? Hey, when I win the lottery, I'll have plenty of money to serve God. I've had people literally come to me and say, oh boy, pastor, if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to give all my money to the church. Well, I don't want that kind of money to begin with, so you can keep that kind of money. I'm not going to take money that's been taken from people who need that money. Unfortunately, we've created a system that does that. The ones who we take from to provide the lottery are the people who need it the most. Right? Second of all, if you're not giving now, you're certainly not going to give when you win the lottery. Like the missionary who's not a soul winner on this side of the Atlantic thinks a plane trip is going to make him win souls. It's not going to happen. Right? So we don't say no to God. We just say, later. Now's not the time, God. Right? God says... Now is the time. God says, consider your ways. You're telling me no, but you're doing it in a way that says yes. What are you putting off in your life by saying later? What are you putting off in your life that you know you need to reprioritize these things? What are you putting off by saying, I'll do it later? Oh, if only I just had... Though I wish, wish, wish a fish. But notice what else. He says here, look at verse number four. Is it time for you, O oh, ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie in waste? That word sealed houses, that means finished with fine wood. That's what that word sealed means. If you walk into some of these old mansions like the one on Summit Avenue in St. Paul or the ones up in Duluth, Area. They'll have paneling with fine wood all over them on the inside. Uh, that's a sealed house. Finished with fine wood. And God says, look at you. You are making your own houses luxurious while mine lies in waste. Do you know what will mess up your priorities? Something that abounds in this country that doesn't necessarily abound everywhere else. And you know what that is? Materialism. How often do we hear messages about materialism? Shouldn't Hollywood teach us that to have everything you desire doesn't make you happy? To have everything you want doesn't satisfy you. It's almost like you spend the first half of your life trying to get what you want. And the rest of the half of your life, you try to realize there's a difference between getting what you want and being satisfied. Isn't that true? Because your first half of your life, you think that getting what you want equals being satisfied. And that's not true. Look at what happens to people when you give them everything they want. Football players and baseball players and... Hollywood actors and all of these things that go along with it. It should show us that there's a vast difference between getting what you want, materialism, and being satisfied. And you know what? One day you wake up, 
Unfortunately, after you've spent most of your time, money, and energy trying to get what you want, and you go, wait a minute, I have what I want. I'm still not happy. Right? And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, you mean getting what you want is different than being satisfied? Do you understand the difference? I've been there. I had to have all the nice stuff. I had to have all of the material things because I thought that it would make me happy. And it was what I wanted. And I had the business and I had the car and I had the everything. Made more money than I possibly ever thought I'd ever make in my life. Things were going well, but then you wake up and you realize, wait a minute, I'm still not happy. Do you realize that it's, it's a wild goose chase that the devil has each and every one of us on, that we're chasing something that we'll never get? That's the moral of the story, right? Right? We go after this, and then we get it, and then we go, wait a minute. Oh, but look at this over here. Well, wait a minute. But look at over here. And you get there, and it's like when you get there, it satisfies you for a period of time, but that's not real satisfaction. So then as you gain experience, just put it nicely like that, what happens? You start to say, I guess there's things that are more important than stuff, right? But you know what? I think for the vast majority of American Christians, we have not learned that lesson. We are very much behind. Like the church of Laodicea when Christ scolds them and says, look, you're rich and increased with goods. You have all the material things you could ever want. But don't you know that you're poor and you're blind and you're miserable? Materialism will mix up your priorities. That's all I'm saying. How do I know that? Because it mixed up the priorities of the children of Israel. They were provided all the materials to rebuild their land. And so they went to work and they began to build themselves nice houses with finished wood and said, oh, what a beautiful home. Right? Nice car in the driveway. Two nice cars in the driveway. A pool. All the toys you could ever want. Amen. Things are going well for me, bless God. But where are your priorities at when it comes to God? Right? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with nice stuff. I'm not even saying there's anything wrong with material things. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with money and being wealthy. I know many wealthy people who, look, they do a great job and they serve the Lord and they've made God a priority. But it's not about the money and the things. It's about our heart and the perception we have toward those. Like the Apostle Paul said, I've gained everything. But guess what? I count it that which comes out of the rear end of a donkey. He says, my perspective is, that's how I view that stuff. Nothing wrong with the stuff. It's how we view the stuff. It's not money that's the root of all evil. Did you know that? The Bible says it's the love of money. It's how you feel about it that is the root of all evil. And materialism is one of the things that is an earmark in our lives to show us that we may have mixed up priorities. When the things become so important that they get in the way of serving God. 
God, I can't rebuild your house now. I've got to finish my house. I'm busy. Well, uh, it's just not time for me to start building your house yet, God. Let me finish mine, then we'll make it a priority. Right. Always later when it comes to God. Isn't it amazing how God seems to make us a priority? But rarely do we make Him a priority. But notice in verse 5. Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. It's time that each and every one of us begin to recognize Areas that we have where our priorities are mixed up. Where the things of this earth have become more important than the things of God. Doesn't the Bible say, love not the things of this world? Right? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Make our priority God. God delivers a message to them and says, consider your ways. I think that's what we need to do here this morning, is for each and every one of us, whether as individuals or families or as a pastor of this church, stop and consider our ways. And say, God, if we made you the most important thing in our lives, or there are there areas where we're saying to you, God, well, we'll do it later. Now's not the time, God. I'll work on my marriage later. I'll work on being a better husband later. I'll work on better, being a better wife later. I'll work on being a better father, a better mother later. I'm busy right now, God. The problem is that we've ensnared ourselves into a system that once it engulfs us, it is very hard to dig our way out. Amen? Amen. Very difficult to dig our way out. And all of a sudden, you come to the place where you want to make God a priority, but now you really can't because you've been ensnared by the whole of materialism. Recognize wrong priorities. Here's the second step. You ready? Realize God's removal. Write that down. Realize God's removal. Okay? You with me so far? You're a good audience. Amen? That makes some of you smile. You like compliments, don't you? Realize God's removal. What does that mean? Well, look at verse number six. You have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Consider your ways. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Look at what he says in verse number nine. Ye looked for much, and lo, it cometh to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man to his own house. God says, I removed my blessing. Amen. And you sowed so much, and you got so little, right? And when you brought it home, I blew on it and scattered it to the wind, right? And when you took wages, you put it in your bag, and it just fell out because there's holes in your bags. 
right? A person with mixed up priorities understands this verse. Amen? Do you ever feel like you just work and work and work and work? Right? And what happens? You got nothing to show for it? Amen? <laughs> I'm hurting some of your feelings, aren't I? I don't mean to, but it's God, what God says. Really? Do you know what I realized? You would think that the more money you make, the more you would have. <laughs> you know what I learned through life? It's not that way. You're always broke. Doesn't matter how much money you make. When your priorities are mixed up, you're always broke. You may have a nice car. You might have a nice home. You might have a good paying job. But you're always broke. Amen? And then you look back and you go, where does it all go? I've made more money than I've ever made in my entire life. And I've got nothing in the bank. You know why? Because you're putting it in bags with holes. Don't you feel that way? There's times when I feel that way. And I go, you know what? I've got to check my priorities. There's times when I feel like I pour out so much work into something. And you get nothing back. It's time to check the priorities. Look at the first thing. Your labor. Your work. Some of you guys are out there working hours a day. What do you have to show for it? I can tell you what you're going to have to show for it. Because of wrong priorities, you're going to have kids that are messed up. Kids need a dad. They don't need a paycheck. How about this? Provisions. Look at what he says. He says, you have sown much and bring in little. There's your labor. You eat much, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with the drink. Well, what does all that mean? Well, when your priorities are messed up, guess what happens? When your priorities are messed up, nothing is ever enough. And your pay. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. You invest labor, you invest provisions, you invest money, and what do you have to show for it when your priorities are messed up? You got nothing. Feels like you're just spinning your tires, you're going nowhere, you're doing nothing. Amen? Look at what he says in verse number 10. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit and I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. See, we don't, we don't think that God can mess with what we do, Right? You ever have weeks where you just feel like you didn't accomplish anything? Amen. Do you ever have that? You know, sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but I'm saying sometimes it's possible that God got involved in that thing because your priorities are mixed up and he said you're not going to accomplish anything, even with your own hands. That's what he did to the children of Israel. He said, I got in the way. I caused a drought. I caused the oil to dry up. And you know what also? I caused the labor of your hands to dry up.
That's what it looks like when our priorities are messed up. So number one, we need to recognize, right? We need to recognize areas where priorities are messed up. You with me? We need to realize that sometimes God removes His blessing from us. And that doesn't necessarily mean that He takes away our nice cars. That's not what that means. It means He removes His blessing from us. It means the things that we put our hands forth to do should garner us some kind of fruit. And when the fruit dries up, well, it's a sign that our priorities are mixed up. Now look at this lastly in 1 Peter chapter 3. Now keep your hand there in Haggai, but look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And look at verse number 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are all over the righteous, are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Look, there is, a, there is the reality of God stopping his blessing to us. Do you realize that? Amen. That if we so choose to live and do whatever we want, and we choose to put ourselves first, and we choose not to make God the priority, guess what? God has every right to say, well, then I'm going to have to remove my blessing from you. And you'll work, and you'll never get anywhere. And you'll eat, and you'll always be hungry. And you'll drink, and you'll never be full. And you'll put on clothes, and you'll never be warm. And you'll fill your bags with money, only to find out that your bags are full of holes. That's what it looks like when somebody's priorities are not where they ought to be. Now let me give this lastly to you. Here's the third step. You ready? Respond to God's message. You see how simple this is? Folks, this isn't rocket science. God made it simple so we all can get it. God made it so simple that even I could preach it. He says, number one, recognize that there are things in your life where priorities are mixed up. Secondly, Realize areas where God is removing His blessing, where you are investing and investing and investing and not getting anything back. That may be a place where priorities have been mixed up. Right? And lastly, God says, respond to my message. Amen. You see, He sent the prophet, Haggai, to deliver a message. God did not audibly speak His voice to the children of Israel, although He could have, right? Certainly. And His voice would have sounded like thunder, and they would have gotten the message. God says, I speak through prophets. And so He sent a man, and that man delivered a message, and the message was, why are you building your own houses when God's house lies in waste? Consider your ways. Will you recognize that there are areas that need to improve in the, in the way of priorities? Secondly, will you recognize and realize that God is removing His blessing? That you're putting everything in and not getting anything back. 
And God says, all you got to do is respond to what I'm saying. Right? He's not even asking us to go run the mile. Right? All right, what you'll need to do is run from the church into Hastings, do that about 10 times, then I'll... No, he's saying, look, just recognize it. Just respond to what I'm saying. I'm going to send a man who's going to deliver a message, and that message is going to be your priorities are mixed up, and all I want you to do is respond. Look at verse number 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltal, the, uh, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, uh, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Right? But look at verse 13, and I think this is the most powerful verse in this entire passage. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto, unto the people, saying, God sent the message. The message was your priorities are mixed Mixed up. I want you to recognize it. I want you to realize that blessing is being removed from you. I want you to respond to my message. And the children of Israel, the Bible says, they did it. Right? They did it. They heard it. They said, all right, here we go. This is it. You're right, God. Our priorities are all mixed up. We've been worried about our own places instead of worrying about your place. They responded to the message when Haggai walked in the door and said, listen, guys. And so what did God do? Verse 13, God said to Haggai, all right, go tell them that the Lord their God is with them. Amen? Wow. That's pretty profound. Because if there's anything that we need in life, it is God to be with us. Right? And God says when you recognize it and you realize it and you respond to it, then... I am with you. Each and every one of us in here this morning should want and desire God to say to us, I am with you. Right? I'm against you if I'm not a priority in your life. But I'm with you if you make me the most important thing. You want to learn how to get stuff done? Because that's ultimately what priorities are about, right? Checklists and what's most important. We want to accomplish things in life, right? You want to get stuff done? Well, you're not going to get anything done if God isn't saying, I'm with you. I want you to think about your family and your home and your children and your relationship with your husband or your wife. And if God were to do an assessment of your whole life and he were to walk through all the nooks and crannies of everything that you got going on, He's able to look at your checking account and see what you've been spending your money on. He's able to look at your schedule and see what you've been spending your time on. Look at everything. 
at the end of the day, would his assessment be, I am with you? Or would his assessment be something else? I think ultimately that's a question that only we can answer to ourselves. But I think that if we were to look at our lives, or if God were to look at our lives, would He say, I am with you? Or is there areas in our lives where we need to begin to reprioritize, that we've put what we want in front of what God wants? Amen? God says, all I want you to do is to realize that there's a priority problem. I want you to recognize that I am responding to that priority problem by removing my hand of blessing. And all I require of you is that you listen to the messenger and respond. And responding includes coming to the altar and saying, God, my priorities are messed up. Please help me. But it doesn't end there. Amen? You can respond to the messenger, but ignore the message. So you need to respond to the messenger. Yes, come to the altar and say, God, you're right, my priorities are mixed up. I recognize that. I'm coming to the altar to say, God, help me with that. But if you leave here and that's all you do and your life remains unchanged with bad priorities, then all you've done is responded to the messenger and ignored the message. Do you see? He says twice in this chapter, consider your ways. I think each and every one of us need to stop and consider where we're at with our priorities. Have we made God number one? 